Hello, sci-fi and adventure fans, and welcome to Ash Bishop's Intergalactic Exterminators, Inc. My name is Gabe Shear, and this is CamCat Unwrapped. If you find yourself loving this book as much as we do, CamCat Unwrapped is hosting a giveaway this week where one lucky winner will receive the full audiobook of Intergalactic Exterminators, Inc. for free. All you have to do to enter is subscribe to our podcast, YouTube channel, or newsletter, and answer a quick survey, all of which are linked in our bio. Each new subscription is one entry, so make sure you enter for your chance to win this book to live in. Enjoy. I'll be introducing you to each episode of Ash Bishop's gripping interplanetary tale of the adventures of Russ Wesley and Nina Hossein Zadeh. Intergalactic Exterminators, Inc. was an Audi Awards 2023 finalist for Best Science Fiction Audiobook, and New York Times bestselling author Jesse Kellerman has described the book as so much fun it ought to be illegal in all known galaxies. This is one of those unputdownable, action-packed stories that prepares you to take on alien invaders and fight your way to hero status in your galaxy. It's a book to live in. Russ Wesley travels to Wyoming after his grandfather's unfortunate passing to help deal with the dead man's affairs. When he finds a mysterious rock among his grandfather's collection of oddities, he asks a local scientist to help him identify it. Nina has never seen anything like it, but neither of them could possibly predict what happens next. In the playful, rollicking style of a modern-day Flash Gordon, we invite you to enjoy the ride as our heroes travel across space and discover new allies, new dangers, new triumphs, and maybe, just maybe, a touch of old-fashioned romance. So gear up, don that gas mask, and throw your ship into hyperdrive for Ash Bishop's Intergalactic Exterminators, Inc. CamCat Publishing presents Intergalactic Exterminators, Inc. by Ash Bishop. Narrated by Scott Brick and Suzanne Elise Freeman. 1. Russ Russ woke up lying flat on the ground, his mind foggy as hell. He could smell blood. When he reached forward as gingerly as possible, his muscles screamed at the movement. He was on his back. The forest trees waved down at him, blocking out the faint moonlight. He took a couple of deep breaths and reached forward again, groping around in the darkness. His hand came back slick with blood and fur and leaves. And then he heard voices. Do you want to do this, then? I just wouldn't call this tracking as all. The blood trail's three feet across. A tiny baby could follow this trail. Show me that baby. Shh, both of you, quiet. Something's registering on the heat index. The confusion and pain made it hard to think. Are these locals, he thought. He fumbled in his pocket, looking for his flashlight, but also testing for further damage. His hand found the light. It illuminated the small clearing. The deer's corpse was just a few feet away, right where he'd shot it. But it wasn't whole. Something had torn off its back legs, shearing straight through the muscle and bone. Russ took a deep breath but didn't let his body or mind react to the sight of the carnage. Seconds later, the stranger's flashlights found him. He's over here, to our left. Russ heard three or four people hurrying through the brush. A woman in all black stepped into the clearing. Her brown hair was tied back in a bun, and she had a long steel shotgun in her hands. An odd earring twinkled in her ear. You okay, son? she asked crouching down to place her hands on his chest. She stared into his eyes, examining him. Looks like you're going into shock. Just stay on your back and concentrate on breathing. A man followed shortly after her, 
He glanced around, holding up a funny-looking flashlight to cast out the darkness. He's alone, the man confirmed. Are you from around here? He asked Russ. I'm from California, Russ groaned. I don't know what that means, the man said. Just hold still, the woman said. She pulled a gadget from her pack. The end telescoped out like an antenna. Russ watched as an aqua blue light shone down from the device, running across his entire body. He flinched as it reached his face, and even that small movement caused his lungs to burst with pain. He's got four broken ribs, a hairline fracture in the left wrist, and a torn hamstring. Did you see what hit you? The woman asked him. Russ tried to think. No. The word was as much a groan as anything else. Tell us what you remember. Russ rolled over onto his side. It hurt badly. Now that she'd pointed out the injuries, everything was localized. His ribs throbbed. His wrist felt hollow. His left leg was pierced with pain. I was driving down Route 89. And a deer... Russ pointed to the half-deer corpse beside him. This deer dashed in front of my car. I knew I'd injured it by the sound it made when it hit the bumper, but I didn't think I'd have to chase it this far into the woods to put it out of its misery. Russ took a moment to swallow. After I shot it, I... I was kneeling, jacking out the leftover rifle shells. But then... I was flipping through the air. I think I hit that tree right behind me. The woman looked back at the tree. It's pretty splintered up. I was flying upside down, backwards. Can you walk? The man asked. Two more women, dressed in the same black combat gear, entered the clearing. They both had long rifles slung over their backs. Russ glanced at the newcomers, his eyes lingering on the guns. They weren't locals. He could tell that much. Who are you guys? Just local hunters, one of the newcomers said. Sure, Russ said. Tell me what hit you, the first woman said firmly. I don't know. A meteor? A buffalo? Maybe a rig? The woman pulled a roll of pills from a molly strap on her backpack. Swallow two of these. They're going to kill the pain. Russ chewed the pills. Their chalky taste filled his mouth and crept up his nose. They won't cure any of the damage. You're going to feel fine, but you're not fine. Move carefully until you can get proper medical treatment. The road is two miles north. Can you reach it without help? Russ nodded. Whatever she gave him was blazing through his bloodstream, kicking the fog and ache off every organ that it passed. What did I just eat? Two miles north. Don't stop for any reason. One of the newcomers, a well-muscled young woman with close-cropped brown hair, glanced at the half-deer corpse lying next to Russ. Its blood had sprayed a pattern across the splintered tree. Look at the animal, Kendron, she said. The guy, Kendron, shone his flashlight over the deer corpse. Whoa, he said. We definitely found what we're looking for. You really chummed the water with this stag, the short-haired woman told Russ. Kendron, Starland, mouths shut, the first woman said, making a slashing gesture. She pulled Russ to his feet. He gritted his teeth against the pain. But it was gone. Kendron and Starland stayed huddled around the deer, crouched low, inspecting where the hindquarters had been sheared off the bone. Kendron looked at the deer's head and saw where Russ had shot it. You make this shot? He asked Russ. In the dark? Yeah. Was the deer already dead? Were you a foot away, point blank? No. I was up on a ledge over by the river, 40 feet in that direction. Russ pointed up the gradual incline. Kendron was still looking at the dead deer. You shot it between the eyes from 40 feet, in the dark. Yeah, I guess. Head on back to the highway, the woman said firmly. You should start now. It might be dangerous to stay here. The way she was looking at him, 
Russ kind of figured she meant that she was what was dangerous, if he didn't do what she said. I just need to find my grandpa's rifle first, Russ told her. She grabbed him by the arm. Her grip was incredibly strong. In the light from her flashlight, her eyes seemed almost purple. Start walking toward... Before she could finish her sentence, the third woman, who'd melted back into the darkness, stepped forward again. Cut the light, she hissed. It's here. Something came crashing through the brush, making a howling sound. It wasn't a sound Russ had ever heard before. It was a deep, rumbling growl, followed by a pitched screech that made the hair on his arms stand up. Branches were snapping, and he could hear claws scraping on rock. It was still thirty feet south, but it scared the hell out of him. El Toreador, you're up, the woman hissed. The girl they called El Toreador had been on lookout. She was far enough into the darkness that Russ could barely see her, just a wisp of thick brown hair bobbing in the darkness. That is, until she pounded her chest with her fist. The vest lit up red, casting shadows across the trees. My real name's Atara, she told Russ quickly. Then, don't look so worried. We're professionals. Starland, hit her with a hormone. The vest is enough, Atara growled. Starland slipped back into the light. She was carrying some kind of tube. It looked like a pool toy. She pushed hard against the end, blasting thick goo all over the other woman. Hurry up. It's almost here. Russ was scrambling around in the brush, looking everywhere for his rifle when the creature burst through the perimeter glow of his tiny flashlight. Atara's vest reflected off its face, bathing it in red light. It was all fangs and claws, huge, twice the size of a grizzly bear and full of rippling muscles stretched out in terrifying feline grace. It leaped at Atara, but mid-flight it caught the scent of the goo and reoriented to the left, bumping her off her feet but not harming her. The huge cat thing landed softly, immediately turning toward the fallen woman, sniffing the air, growling, and bobbing its head. It's got the scent. The big kitty's feeling amorous, Kendrin yelled. He, Starland, and the other woman all had their rifles raised. They were tracking the cat, ready to fire. Atara looked pissed, sprawled on the ground with her legs splayed. Knock it down. We're authorized for lethal. What are you waiting for? She shouted. The creature was fully in the light now. It looked a lot like a tiger, but it was at least six times the size, with wavy, shaggy hair. What the hell is it? Russ shouted. The feline was practically straddling Atara. I don't like how it's looking at me. Come on, shoot, she demanded. The creature battered a paw, claws extended, and tore the glowing vest off her chest. It drew the vest up to its nose, sniffed, and started to growl again. Then the huge beast paused, slowly turning away from Atara. It sniffed the air, shoulders hunched, fur on the scruff of its neck rising. As it turned, its deep onyx eyes looked squarely at Russ. It growled and took a step toward him. Russ thought his heart had been beating hard before, but as the huge cat glided toward him, the thudding in his chest was so loud it drowned out every other sound. He didn't even hear the discharge of Starlin's shotgun, two feet away from the monster. The wad of pellets sprayed against the creature's flank, and it howled, tearing away into the darkness so fast, Russ didn't even see it move. Atara scrambled to her feet and dropped her rifle. Did you see that? A direct hit and no penetration. I told you Earth tech was garbage. What is this, the 13th century? I'm powering up. The first woman, the one with the purple eyes, glanced at Russ. She was short, wiry, with the powerful shoulders of a linebacker. Russ realized she was the leader of whoever these people were. When are you going to learn to keep your mouth shut? She barked at Atara. You already used the CRC wand on him. Two hours of mandatory training videos. The second this is over. I'd rather be cat food than watch those again, Atara said. You skip the videos, and I'll send you back through cert training. Atara wasn't really listening. She crashed off through the brush in the direction of the big cat. Nodding toward Russ, the woman shouted, Kendrin, 
You've got containment. Then she disappeared into the darkness. Starland drew a pistol from her belt and followed. Containment? More like babysitting, Kendron grumbled. I should be the one doing the good stuff. He glanced in the direction they'd gone. Russ kind of agreed. Kendron was huge, at least 6'5", and covered from head to toe with what Russ's cousin had always called beach muscles. He had thick, wavy hair down to his shoulders. Out in the darkness, Russ could see the others' flashlights bobbing up and down. They were headed up an incline, probably straight toward the bank of the river. Was it my imagination? Or was the cat more interested in you than the vest covered in mating hormone? Kendrin asked. At first, Russ didn't answer. Finally, he said, What would make it do that? No idea. It's supposed to follow the hormone. What's better than sex? Kendron shook his head, seemingly unable to answer his own question. He frowned slightly. The only thing I've seen them more interested in is an Obin's stone. You ever seen an Obin's stone? They're about this big. Kendron held his hands six inches apart, usually green, with yellow veins running all along the edges. I don't think they're native to this area. Kendron looked around in distaste. But I've seen these cats jump planets just to get near one if it's in an unrefined state. An Obin's stone is basically intergalactic catnip. I've never seen one. Russ told him. His voice wavered slightly, but Kendron didn't seem to notice. Then we better shut this vest down, Kendron said. He stepped up onto a boulder and reached high into a tree, grabbing the vest from where the cat had tossed it. He folded the vest up and tucked it under his arm. I'm not even sure how to turn it off, he said. That was a saber-toothed tiger, right? You guys cloning stuff? Is this... Jurassic World or something? Russ rubbed his temple. His questions were coming so fast they were jumbled in his mouth. Kendron had just said intergalactic and something about jumping planets. But here in the dark Wyoming forest, six miles from his grandmother's house, he wasn't yet ready to face those pieces of information. Kendron threw the vest on the ground and raised his rifle, pumping a slug into it. It kept glowing. Damn. It's pretty important I get this thing turned off. Starlin's discarded rifle was just a few feet away. While Kendrin kicked at the vest with his boot heel, Russ inched toward it. Touch the weapon and I'll shoot you in the face, Kendrin said. He stomped on the vest again. The flashlights were way north now, probably on the other side of the river. Russ could hear the distant voices arguing about which way the big cat went. The voices were so loud, neither Kendrin nor Russ heard the cat until it was right in front of them, growling, hissing, and spitting. It stalked into the circumference of the faint red light from the vest. Kendrin was still standing on the vest, his rifle slung over his shoulder. Beside him, the cat was enormous, twice as tall as a man. It crouched down, looking him straight in the eye. I'm dead, he said quietly. The creature coiled back on its powerful flanks and threw itself forward like a bullet. Its wicked claws stretched out, razored edges slashing at Kendrin's neck and chest. Russ kicked Starlin's gun off the ground, caught it, leveled it, and fired. The bullet split the cat's eye socket, ripping through its optic nerve and straight into its brain. Momentum carried the dead body forward on its trajectory, smashing into Kendrin and pinning him to the earth. A few moments later, the rest of the team returned, clambering through the thick brush. The leader approached the enormous beast and nudged it with her boot. Is it dead, Baren? Atara asked, her gun still pointed at the fallen creature. Sure is, the leader, Baren, responded. The wind was starting to pick up, blowing the branches of the trees, shaking off a few dead leaves. How about Kendrin? Negative, Baren said. Get her off me, Kendrin demanded. It's got to weigh 900 pounds. How many intergalactic laws do you think we've broken here? Atara asked. She moved next to Baren, looking down at Kendrin with an expression that was half pity and half amusement. He had managed to sit up, but his legs were still wedged under the huge carcass. 
including the law about referencing intergalactic law on a Tier 9 planet? Baran asked. You guys are being a little careless, Starlin said. Not our fault this thing was a hundred miles off course. The MUP map promised there wouldn't be any Tier 9 bios in the vicinity. What are we supposed to do now? Atara said, nodding toward Russ. Oh, we're conscripting him for sure, Baran said. Really? Atara said. We're getting another human? Who? Who do you mean? Russ asked. He glanced back in the direction of the highway. His eyes were starting to adjust to the dark again, and he could make out a thick copse of trees just a dozen or so yards away. Get the huge beast off me, Kendrin insisted. Baren moved to one side of the big cat and dug her powerful shoulders into it. Starland ran over to join her, wedging one arm against the creature's flank, but putting her other arm around the waist of the woman giving the orders. Atara, come on. You, new guy. We could use your help, too. It's heavy as hell. Russ half ran over to them and dug his side into the creature. Its hairy skin sloshed around against the pressure, but the four of them eventually got it moving. Roll it the other way, Kendrin demanded. Its penis is right next to my face. They kept rolling, and Kendrin kept protesting as the great shaggy cat slowly grinded over his shoulders and face. Gravity finally caught hold of its weight, and the corpse flopped to the ground. The three in black all chuckled as Kendrin spit out the taste of cat testicle. Oh, that's what you meant. Sorry about that, Starlin said, laughing. Kendrin crawled onto his knees, still hacking and spitting. He stopped for a minute and looked at the cat's face, poking a finger in the thing's empty eye socket and wiggling it around. Another hell of a shot. The debriefing wasn't just wrong about location, Atara said. The creature's fur is like steel mesh. Our bullets were doing jack shit. Kendrin rolled up onto his knees, both hands propped on his thighs. You saved my life, he told Russ. No problem, Russ said. It was the last thing, Russ said, before he dropped the rifle and sprinted full speed back toward the safety of the trees. He was running as fast as he could, pumping his arms, banging his shins on rocks, bumping past pines, carelessly plunging through the dark. He'd only gotten about twenty yards, running full speed, when something metal slapped around his ankle. It tipped him off balance, and for the second time that night, he could feel himself careening head over heels. He hit a tree, again, then slowly slipped out of consciousness. Two, Russ, 72 hours previous. It all began somewhere in Louisiana. He'd just finished his 13th day of working the line on a petrochemical plant in Baton Rouge. 13 days of lifting this and pushing that. He'd found that in these kinds of jobs, they rarely let the new guy do anything important, which was fine with Russ. The paycheck was what was important to Russ. He'd expected Baton Rouge, with its strange cultural mix of French, English, and Spanish, to keep his interest, but he'd soured on it almost immediately. He had hoped for music and lights, dancing and distraction. What he'd found was a tired populace dragging themselves to early morning factory jobs and spending evenings binge-watching Netflix. It was the same thing he'd found in Shreveport, and Fort Worth before that. A bank teller had tipped him off to an exotic restaurant south of Lafayette that served alligator meat burritos, and Russ had found himself headed in that direction, moving aimlessly down Highway 49. His eyes kept drifting to the dash, hoping E didn't really mean empty, when a text from his mother arrived. Your grandfather passed away this morning. I know you cared a lot about Grandpa. You might think about calling Norma or sending a card. The funeral is tomorrow in Evanstown. Cared a lot about Grandpa was an understatement. Russ had pulled over to the side of the highway and cried for two minutes. He'd wiped his tears with a napkin that happened to be stuffed into his door handle, and you turned, pointing the car back northbound. Then he'd driven 22 hours straight to Evanstown, Wyoming. 
On the way, he drunk 14 energy drinks and chewed every over-the-counter energy pill he could find. By the last seven hours, he was seeing double and only swerving the car a little bit. And he'd learned a hard lesson. The small orange gas station pills called Stree Overlord that he'd spent the last of his money on weren't energy pills at all, but rather some kind of Chinese sexual stimulant. Still, he made it to Evanstown, awake nearly on time, and with only a mile direction. It was strange driving down off the overpass back into Evanstown for the first time in over a decade. It didn't seem like much had changed. The topography was the same. A wall of wild lodgepole pines still hid much of the main portion of the town from the interstate. He recognized many of the stores, the hardware store, the post office, even the same cluster of liquor stores, mostly there to serve those sneaking across the border from Utah, desperate for a quick drag of something stronger than 3.2%. There were a lot of empty buildings as well, shells of businesses gone under, their roofs sagging, their windows still promising reduced prices and going out of business liquidations. Russ couldn't remember if there had been that many empty spots the last time he'd cruised into town. He wouldn't admit it to anyone, but despite caring a great deal for his grandparents, he'd purposely avoided Evanstown during the last few years of his travels. When he was still a kid, Evanstown had been a safe place for him a place where his grandma was always able to tolerate his childish hyperactivity. He'd come there a lot during his youth, shipped out east when his mom had had enough. Rather than try to control him, his grandma had filled his head with all the possibilities of the future. I know you'll be someone great someday, Russ, she always told him. Your restlessness is hiding a true talent for intellectual curiosity. Your grandfather is the same way. When you grow up, you're going to make all the Wesleys proud. Yet here he was, eight years removed from his last failed effort to go to college, closing in on the tail end of his twenties, and he'd made exactly no one proud. Aside from impressing a few people here and there with his marksmanship, Russ hadn't managed to accomplish much of anything at all, though she would be the last one to ever verbalize it. Russ knew he had let his grandmother down in some significant but undefinable way. The graveyard was at the east end of town. He could see a crowd halfway up a 15-degree incline clustered around a modest grave. It seemed about a full tenth of the populace of Evanstown had shown up, roughly 500 people. They had black cowboy hats, black shirts, jackets, and blouses hanging loose over dirty black jeans and black cowboy boots. The crowd shifted their feet in the hot August sun. Their heads bowed respectfully. A short, bespectacled chaplain stood over the freshly dug grave, and as Russ climbed the small hill to the site, he could see the pallbearers lowering his grandfather's casket into the ground. Russ looked over the pallbearers, then the crowd. But even before he saw the last face, he knew that he was the only California Wesley to make the service. He refused to acknowledge how light his grandfather's casket looked as they lowered it. His grandpop had been a robust man, just some red hair shy of looking a lot like King Henry VIII. Russ couldn't imagine that big man, with his even bigger personality, fitting in that coffin much less being light enough to carry without difficulty. The chaplain began to talk about Russ's grandfather's time as a Navy corpsman and the heroic things he'd done during the Korean War. He talked about his grandfather's travels, how he'd journeyed from one coast to the other, picking up odd antiquities and rare books, how he'd used his knowledge to keep one of Evanstown's last privately owned stores in business, and a bookstore at that. As the chaplain continued, Russ pushed his way to the front and stood quietly next to his grandmother, Norma. She turned a tear-stained face to his, her eyes widening in surprise. Then she took his hand, cinched herself against his shoulder, and buried her old, frail head in the crook of his arm. Her body shook, and Russ clenched her tighter. And suddenly his own insecurities 
and the drudgery of the 22-hour drive didn't mean anything at all. After the service, a smaller group of funeral attendants moved into a temporary annex near the entrance to the graveyard. Inside, a man in an oversized suit sat behind a small desk. Russ recognized him as Norma's lawyer, Mr. Baedeker. His tie was too long and his suit was too large, but both were clean and wrinkle-free. The air conditioner was whirring noisily, but beads of sweat still rolled down Mr. Baedeker's forehead. Norma had yet to release Russ's arm. She kept saying, he'd be so happy to know you'd come. I won't keep you all very long, Mr. Baedeker told the small crowd. It's hot, and I know B.B. Wynn has been kind enough to host an after-service wake at her home with some of her delicious hors d'oeuvres. I understand she's been working on them throughout the day. It sounds like a party that would have made Clark proud. The man mopped his forehead with a handkerchief. I have the pleasure of acting as Clark's testator, and as such, I have been asked to share the details of his final will and testament. Unfortunately, as many of you know, Clark's long illness drained the Wesley family of much of their material possessions. As such, there is almost nothing to announce. The lawyer pointed to a red-headed man in a black vest. William, he asked that you receive his telescope and all related astronomy apparati, including the lenses. Sweet, William said, letting out a short whistle. The lawyer pointed to an older woman. She had a shock of curly white hair bound tightly. Martha, he said that you should come by his garage and take anything that you can use. That's fantastic, Martha said, except his gun collection. Oh, Martha said, visibly disappointed. Who gets that? He left his gun collection to his grandson, Russell Wesley. Oh, Russ said, surprised. Norma turned and looked at Russ, her red eyes searching his face. He really wanted you to have them, she whispered. Grandma, I... Norma shushed him with a raised finger. We both knew you wouldn't have any place to put them all. You can keep them in our garage if you'd like, or sell them, or give them to friends. Clark just wanted to make sure you had the guns if you wanted them. The lawyer interrupted. The exact words of the will read thus. No one has ever made those guns sing the way my grandson can. He was enormously proud of your marksmanship, Norma told Russ. Russ marveled at his sudden ownership of a vast expanse of rare guns. He was thinking about the Car 98 and the Merkel 141, and especially the M25 Whitefeather. He had trouble concentrating on anything else as the testator gave away Clark's Life magazine collection and his military medals. After the reading was concluded, almost everyone shuffled out of the muggy annex. Before Russ and his grandma could reach the door, Mr. Baedeker waved Norma over to his desk. I've got some bad news regarding another matter, I'm afraid, he told her. Stay here a moment, Norma told Russ. She walked reluctantly over to the desk, and the two spoke in low whispers. Russ couldn't hear the words, but he saw his grandma's face fall as the lawyer spoke emphatically into her ear. He wondered what the news was that couldn't wait until a day or two after his grandfather was put in the ground. As Norma shuffled back to his side, he started to ask her, but the depth of sadness in her eyes told him his question could wait for another time. Tired from the long drive and the heavy emotions, Russ slept on the porch at B.B. Wen's, missing out entirely on her delicious hors d'oeuvres. It was B.B. herself who shook him awake. B.B. was a first-generation Filipino immigrant. Norma and B.B. were the same age, but unlike Norma, B.B. dyed her white hair in avian red and permed it into tight curls. The curls bobbed in Russ's face as she gently shook his shoulder. Also, unlike Norma, B.B. wore a lot of makeup, most noticeably a heavy, light blue eyeliner. 
Despite spending much of the last half century in Evanstown, Bibi still spoke with a distinct Filipino accent. On the other hand, Norma's voice carried the echo of a quite different accent, that of someone born and raised in southern Wyoming. Yet, for all their differences, Bibi had been Norma's best friend for as long as Russ could remember. He recognized the concern expression on Bibi's face as identical to the one he'd seen on Norma's just an hour or two before, when the lawyer had been whispering in her ear. Have you been to the bookstore yet? Bibi asked Russ. I drove straight to the funeral, Russ explained. You might not want to visit the bookstore, Bibi cautioned him. Like your grandpa, it's better to remember things when they were at their best. Russ sat up, shaking off the cobwebs. Still reeling from the death of his grandpa, he was nowhere near ready for more bad news, especially if it involved the bookstore. What exactly is, he started to say. Don't bother the boy with our troubles, Norma interrupted. She was standing at the edge of the porch, nibbling on a deviled egg. My grandson was the only one of us smart enough to never put down roots. We don't ask him to come around just to share in our burdens. He deserves the happy life of a wanderer. Heaven knows. Someone should have it. Grandma? Russ asked. Tell me what's going on with the bookstore. Norma found it easier to show Russ instead. It didn't take long for them to reach the quaint little cultural center of Evanstown, Wyoming. It was mostly a ranching town, but there was a patchwork golf course, a small community theater, and a few things for people who liked learning, including Russ's grandparents' bookstore. The Walmart Supercenter was just a handful of miles south in the neighboring town of Banville. They approached the front of the store, and Russ could read the old faded sign, The Mysterious Universe. New and used books, oddities, knickknacks. I'm not ready to go home just yet, she told him. But I'm sure not ready to go in the bookstore either. I'll wait for you outside. Norma's hands shook as she worked the old key in the lock. True to her word, she didn't follow him inside. The smell of decaying books was so strong that Russ had to go immediately to the window and wiggle it open. He didn't have to ask his grandma when someone had last been inside. It was clear it had been a while. The open sign wasn't just turned off. It had been taken out of the window and laid across the checkout counter. Above his head, the ceiling was darkened with moisture, clear evidence of a leak or multiple leaks in the roof. Someone had nailed a tarp under several of the leaks, but rainwater had just filled it like a balloon and then dribbled over the side. Russ wanted to tell his grandmother, you've got to put the tarp on top of the leak, not under it, but bit his tongue. His grandfather's illness had taken a lot out of Norma, and he guessed the condition of the bookstore was probably a pretty good metaphor for how she was feeling in general. Russ explored the small store, moving down the hall to the employee bathroom, the tiny break room, and the extended storage room in the back. He reached the other door, which led into an overgrown alley, and he stopped a moment to collect his thoughts. It's all right, Russ. He heard his grandmother's frail voice float down the hall. Everything is finite. Everything ends. Russ turned around to face her words. The way the sound wove through the store, it seemed to be coming directly from the stacks of moldy, unorganized books. Without your grandfather, without your grandfather healthy, this store was too much for me to organize and run on my own anyhow. And so much of it reminds me of him. If I go in there, it will be like he's back alive. It has so many memories. Makes the most sense to just let the bank have it. Serves them right anyway. What are they going to do with a bunch of soggy books? Russ stuck his head into the storage room. It was where his grandfather had kept all the oddities he collected on his travels. Russ saw a whole cabinet full of neon-colored quartz rocks, three long carved sticks that looked suspiciously like magic wands, and a beanie baby shaped like a minotaur. When he picked it up, he realized it wasn't a beanie baby after all. Its skin felt like human flesh. 
There were several bins full of more trinkets and oddities. A clump of gray and bone-white mush caught his eye. The edges were crusted in red, suggesting it had at one point been actively bleeding. Russ studied it for a moment, trying to decide if it was a dead rodent or a dehydrated flower. When he finally picked it up, it fell apart in his hands, leaving a gory sludge on his fingers. Norma had always found these things distasteful and grotesque, and as Russ wiped his hands on his jeans, he understood why. A lot of the stuff in the back closet was at best unrecognizable, and at worst, borderline occult. Russ knew that his grandfather had established an online portal a few years ago, and that the supplemental income from this had saved the store, at least temporarily. Nearly all their online sales had been made from this backroom collection. Even in this room, which was better insulated from the water, the smell of rot was almost unbearable. Russ walked back to the main portion of the store and picked the open sign up off the counter. Norma had come to the window and was staring at him, curious. Now what are you going to do with that? she asked. When Russ didn't answer, she said, Do you want it as a keepsake? It's just a silly neon sign, and it doesn't even light up all the way. Grandma, Russ said, I'm putting this sign where it belongs. In the trash? In the window. Russ hung the sign up. He grabbed the plug and fished around for the wall socket under the window frame. Russ, if you plug in that sign, people will think the store is open again. Russ found the wall socket and the sign lit up. Op mm. Or at least they'll think it's open, Norma said wryly. Well, we don't want to confuse them, Russ told her. I better get to work so we can get this sucker opened up. Three, Russ. Despite his stirring announcement, Russ didn't immediately get to work. He drove back to his grandma's small home just off the banks of Bear River and crashed on a couch until the following morning. Then he got to work. He figured it made the most sense to start in the back and move toward the front of the store. The spring rains had come through the damaged roof and wet the books, and now the summer heat was bringing unwelcome life to the pages. Without any money for cleaning supplies, he had to rely on good old-fashioned elbow grease. Every book that had too much moisture damage went into the dumpster in the alley. He must have thrown out two dozen copies of Fifty Shades of Grey, Fifty Shades Darker, Fifty Shades Freed, Fifty Shades Even More Darker Still, he thought. He wasn't looking forward to moving into the storage room. The fleshy minotaur seemed to follow him with its eyes. Still, if he needed some capital to begin repairs, he knew that selling something from the back was his best chance. He held his nose and dug in. The water had only damaged the southern corner of the room, seeping into a collection of Led Zeppelin vinyl records that were now stuck together like a band sandwich. Everything under the records was in sealed plastic bins, which were unharmed. The top bin was full of snake skins, but their colors were unnatural, swirling hues of blue, purple, and onyx. The bin under that held only a single item, an enormous crab claw. Russ lifted it out with both hands and raised it up toward the single light bulb dangling from the ceiling. The claw was at least two feet by three feet and weighed close to thirty pounds. He knew it couldn't have come from a real crab. The thing would have had to have been eight or ten feet tall. But as he moved the claw around in the light, he couldn't find how it had been constructed. The parts seemed to fit together organically, like a real exoskeleton. He was relieved to find the bin in the back corner filled only with books. Of course, when he looked closer, the books appeared slightly misshapen, their covers uneven, the ink dry and brittle. Now that's odd. He pushed at the topmost book with his finger, and it dissolved into ash beneath his hand. The ash blossomed up his nose, and he went into a fit of sneezing, only stopping long enough to say, What in the hell? His eyes still fluttering against the sting of the ash, Russ held the bottom of his shirt to his face, waiting, very curious. A portion of the entire book stack had collapsed under the slightest pressure. 
Beneath the ash were three more books. Now that he looked at them closer, they seemed to be holding their shape only by force of will. Had somebody tried to fight against the water damage by putting these books in an oven? He grabbed a ceremonial Aztec knife from one of the boxes and poked at the edges of the burned husk. It collapsed onto itself, falling into a pile of ash. This time the ash didn't plume, and Russ realized that a clump of something was in the middle. Russ crouched over it, looking closely. The object reminded him of a burned chunk of meat. He tapped it with the knife, and another layer of ash shook free. What remained wasn't burned meat, but rather a smooth, oblong stone, about four inches in length. Russ lifted it gingerly, balanced it on the blade of the knife. He blew away the last of the ash that covered it. What is this thing? Russ wondered out loud. For all the oddity of the burned books, the stone itself might have been the weirdest part of the whole enterprise. It was an unnatural lime green, and when Russ tilted it in a certain direction, he could see a network of yellow veins branching in all directions across its face. A few hours later, he showed his find to his grandma, Norma. You said it was in the storage room? Norma asked. They were sitting at the small wooden table in the kitchen of her small wooden home. She peered at the stone in his hand. It was under a pile of books. Actually, the books were burned to a crisp, if that seems possible. We had a fire? The whole thing was weird, Grandma, Russ admitted. It didn't seem like a fire. They weren't burned, I guess. More like sucked dry. Norma tilted her head. Vampires? No, I mean the books near the rock were burned, literally to a crisp. Some of the others were scattered in a circle around the rock, like there'd been an explosion. Exploding, burning vampires, Norma said. I'm glad you can laugh, Russ told her, scratching his cheek. I tried to stay out of your grandfather's collection of trinkets. To be honest, they frightened me. Are you sure you want to spend so much time and effort working on all this? What's the name of the guy that owns Ace Hardware, with a beard? Russ asked. Bobby. He's a big gun enthusiast, isn't he? He's been after your grandfather's collection for at least a decade. He was respectful enough not to call while your grandpop was sick, but he really wants to get his hands on them. I'm going to see if he'll trade building materials and one or two roofing lessons for a few of the guns. Norma's eyes searched Russ's face. A new roof is so expensive. We got a few bids, but I can do the work. I did some apprentice roofing in Washington a few years back. I just need the materials and a little help. Russ bobbed his head. It could work, he realized. You'll be sticking around that long? Russ lifted the rock again, studying its strange network of yellow veins. I guess I am. It will give me a few days to investigate the rock thing, too. Do you mind? He watched a slow smile creep across Norma's face. Do I mind? I'd be delighted. Russ felt a rush of pride fill his chest. He held up the rock again. I don't suppose you know any geologists. Norma's eyes lit up, now matching her broad smile. The funeral had been so melancholy, but his visit and his attempts to resurrect the bookstore seemed to have put a little spring back in her step. Again, involuntarily, he felt a warmth in his chest because he seemed to be making her proud. We do have a geologist of sorts in town, Norma said. You spend enough time in the hospital, you really get to know all the other regulars. There's a fine young lady that lives on the edge of town named Nina Hosenzada. Her father's liver is just about quit, so she was in the hospital with him at least as much as I was with your grandpa. Heck, she's probably there now. Norma smiled at Russ and something flickered behind her eyes for just a moment. Russ couldn't identify it. His grandma continued, She's also the smartest woman in all of Evanstown. She's built an electronics lab in an old storage shed at her parents' home, nearly out of scrap, as I understand it. She'd get to telling us about some serious experiment she was trying to run, 
with all this banged-up, half-cocked equipment, and it would have your grandpa and I hooting with laughter. I'm almost certain she'd be able to tell you a thing or two about your mysterious rock. Bum's Sandwich Emporium in Evanstown, Wyoming, wasn't the kind of place you'd expect to find the smartest woman in town. Bum sold 75-cent sandwiches that were exactly as good as they sounded. Russ pushed his way through Bum's door, a little worried he was walking into an awkward romantic setup. After a little consideration, he'd realized that the look he'd seen flashing across his grandmother's face was what he called her matchmaker expression. His fear had been nearly confirmed when he'd asked how he would recognize Nina, and Norma told him, smugly, Oh, you'll know when you see her. She's easy to spot. She was easy to spot. If someone had asked Russ to close his eyes and picture the perfect woman, the image in his head would have been eerily similar to Nina Hosanzada. She had a wild shock of curly black hair that spiraled in every direction, framing her large brown eyes. Her arms and shoulders were lean but curved with muscle. Her mouth was set in a smile, naturally, just by the shape of her lips and her gums. Russ loved women who smiled without smiling. He could see the intelligence in her bright eyes. She seemed to miss nothing, watching him walk toward her, examining him with careful scrutiny. He immediately regretted not combing his hair, but he knew that if he reached up to pat down his cowlick, it would tell her everything she needed to know about what was going on inside his head. She was wearing jeans, mismatched socks, and a silk-screened shirt with a rifle diagram on it. She also had huge breasts, though Russ didn't notice them at all. He wasn't the type to notice that kind of thing, he assured himself. She sat with a book in her lap and her legs tucked under her. As he arrived at her table, she gave him a half-smile and dog-eared the page of her book. Are you Russ Wesley? she asked. I'm Nina. Russ shook her hand, still standing awkwardly beside the table. Nina kicked an unoccupied chair and it skittered to a stop next to him. Your grandma said you found a weird rock? Russ pulled the rock from his pocket and set it down next to her sandwich tray. He took the seat across from her. He had already decided it best to ignore how beautiful she was. Nina peered down at the rock. Her eyes searched the edges of the stone as her fingers ran along the yellow veins. I've never seen anything like it, she said. Neither have I. Could that color possibly be natural? You found this in the bookstore? It was in the storage area in the back. My grandfather collected odd things, but my grandmother doesn't remember him bringing it home or trying to sell it on the website. Have you been to the store? I've been shopping there my whole life. Norma and I have spent a lot of time together in the hospital, but I've known her for at least a decade. When I was 13... I used to ride my bike down to the mysterious universe almost every day to look at the weird stuff your grandfather had collected. And to buy romance novels, Nina laughed. Russ peered over at the book in her lap. It was called Saving the Rancher's Daughter. I'd love to help out if I could, Nina told him. What do you know about exotic alien minerals, Russ asked, drawing her attention back to the rock. Nina shook her head. It's not a mineral, or at least not a silicate. She looked back at Russ, and for the first time he saw an emotion other than confidence flicker across her face. I'm actually much more of an expert on electricity. It's what I'm studying at Laramie, electrical engineering. I know quite a bit about magnetics, but aside from that, I'm not sure why your grandma thought I could help. Russ shrugged. It's okay. You've got to know more than me, which is nothing at all. And worst case, I still get to eat a 75-cent BLT. I won't order that. There's almost no bacon. These sandwiches suck, Russ agreed. To be honest, I think your grandmother was trying to set us up, Nina admitted. She pulled a compass out of her pocket and wiped its small round screen with her shirt. I was worried about that too, Russ said. This isn't a date, is it? Nina asked. Nope. Good. 
I think I'm offended. Don't be. You seem cool. I'm just not in the market. Fair enough. What's with the compass? It's a simple test. If the rock is magnetic, it'll attract the compass needle. Nina moved the compass around the perimeter of the rock. The needle never stopped pointing north. And it's not magnetic, Nina concluded. This is a crude diagnostic, of course, but a rock like this should have some polarity. She turned it over in her hand again. If you could bring this to my lab, I might be able to run a few more official tests on it. I don't have too much else to do. Nina stood up, carefully placing the rock back into Russ's hand and then wrapping what was left of her sandwich. My lab is unorthodox. It's on my parents' property. Maybe come by later today? Okay. Russ spotted the silkscreen on her shirt again. Do you hunt? The image on your shirt. That's a diagram for a bolt-action rifle, isn't it? Sort of, she said, looking down at her shirt. It's an M24, isn't it? My grandpa has an M25, or had one. I guess it's mine now. Nina pointed to her shirt. This is an M21, and it's not a bolt action. It uses a gas piston. She stretched the image tight and pointed out the piston on the diagram. Nina released her shirt and stuffed the leftover sandwich into the pocket of her pants. I live out on Old Highway 107. We're the only house on the south side of Country Road. She moved toward the door, pausing to rest her hand on the push bar. Maybe bring along the M25. I'd love to shoot a white feather. Russ watched her leave. Beautiful. Smart. Likes to hunt. He tried to be mad at his grandmother for playing matchmaker. But the anger just wouldn't come. Four. Nina. By 6.30 that evening, Nina had already finished reading Saving the Rancher's Daughter. She'd been trying to decide on her next book, stuck between the equally promising Having the Frenchman's Baby and Shackled to the Sheik. She didn't want to admit it to herself, but she was excited. Excited to have a visitor who wasn't one of the same old folks around town. Excited that he was bringing a genuine mystery. Most important, she was excited to get her mind off all the other stuff. She thought she heard Russ's car in the driveway outside, and she found herself moving quickly to the dirty picture window on the front of her parents' house. What she saw outside surprised her. A beat-up green sedan peeling away from her property. Propped against the perimeter fence was a bouquet of red and pink balloons. Nina moved quickly out the front door, grabbing the M21 rifle that she kept in the entryway. She lined the rifle's sight on the fleeing car, flipping open the scope to get a good look at its license plate. Whoever was driving had draped a cloth over it. Nina passed through the kitchen to grab a pair of scissors, then walked outside, crossing her parents' elegant but extremely run-down front porch. At the base of the balloon bouquet, she found a sealed envelope with her name written across it in a flourish of red ink. Don't like this, she mumbled to herself. She was using the scissors to pop the balloons when Russ rolled up her long driveway in a faded maroon mercury tracer. As he climbed out of the car, a rifle in his hand, Nina noticed he'd changed his clothes. They were nicer, apart from a very run-down, she would use the word bedraggled, pair of shoes. His hair, which this afternoon had been defiantly unkempt, was now carefully groomed. He looked handsome, but Nina didn't let herself acknowledge this. She had too many other things on her mind. Hello, Nina said, welcoming him. This is an incredible house, Russ told her. Thanks. When you get closer, you'll see it's pretty run down. My dad's on dialysis, and he wasn't exactly Mr. Fix-It before he got sick. Nina gestured to the green fields past the house. We have 10 acres, but that's because nobody else wants the land around here. Actually, my mom listed it on the market three months ago. If you happen to have several hundred thousand dollars lying around, it could be yours. 
Russ patted his empty pockets. I have just enough to afford one more sandwich, he told her. He nodded to the balloons. Did you guys just have a party? No, it's the weirdest thing. Someone just drove up here and left this. That Saturn that passed me headed back to the highway? Yeah, shit green with oxidized paint. Did you get a look at the driver? No, sorry, I didn't think it was important. Did you read the card? I'm a little nervous to. Russ took the card out of her hand. Looks like it's a romantic gesture from a secret admirer. Russ tore open the envelope. He read aloud, I dream of being near you every day. I don't care what they say, I cannot stay away. Every day. Oof, Russ said. Very bad writing. Nina tried to keep herself from blushing. Not that she was flattered by the romantic gesture. She was upset by it. Any idea who left all this? Russ asked. He looked at the card, the balloons, and the flowers. You have an obsessive ex-boyfriend or something? Nina took the card back and reread the poem. She studied the handwriting. It seemed faintly familiar. I wish it were that simple, she told Russ. I think it's my boss. What? My 50-year-old, fat-ass, gropey, married boss. Give me a second to cut up these balloons, then we can go inside and I'll tell you the whole story. Nina grabbed at one of the pink balloons, lifting the scissors to its neck. Wait a sec, Russ told her. I can think of something better to do with them. A few minutes later, Nina and Russ were lying side by side on a picnic blanket in her backyard. They were on their stomachs, and she was fiddling with the optics on the white feather. Russ raised a pair of binoculars to his eyes and stared out at the balloon, doing his best to judge the distance. It's about 1,300 feet, he told her. It's not going to matter if I can't get this scope mounted, Nina said. She was attaching her own scope, a Burris XTR, but it was fighting her. When they'd passed the chicken coops headed into the backyard, she'd picked an actual white feather from the ground, gathered her unruly curls back into a bun, then stuck the feather into it. Russ's grandfather's gun was a thing of beauty. It was perfectly preserved, all glowing wood and steel. It hadn't been crafted to work with the Burris XTR specifically, but she was managing to wedge it on with a universal adapter. Russ rolled onto his knees, and Nina noticed him catching a quick look at his shoes. She suspected they had been white once, but now they were a combination of brown, tan, and yellow, with the occasional patch of gray fabric insulation poking through. Trying to be inconspicuous, he slipped them off and tucked them under the edge of the blanket. It was kind of cute. Nina felt the knobs finally lock into place. Got it, she said, raising the rifle to show him she'd mounted the scope. Then she raised the scope to her left eye. Russ peered through the binoculars at the balloon again. The wind's running about five miles an hour. I'd go a two-foot lead. And you'd miss. Nina told him, pulling the trigger. The gun let out a satisfying thump, and they watched the balloon, way in the distance. It stared back at them, unpopped. And I'd miss too, Nina said. She handed Russ the gun and took the binoculars from him. Nina stared through the binoculars. The wind is picking up. I'd go with a... Before she could finish her sentence, Russ pulled the trigger. The gun thumped. And off in the distance, the balloon snapped out of existence. Nina felt a combination of emotions wash over her. First was the pleasure of watching the balloon erased. The second was marvel at the perfect shot. Do it again, do it again, Nina said. Russ pulled the trigger. Thump, pop. Wow, Nina said. It's really my only exceptional quality, Russ told her. Then after a moment, I can also punch things. Thump, pop, thump, pop. A few minutes later, 
there was only one balloon left. Nina tried again and missed it. She was angry enough about the romantic gift that she hadn't yet explained the situation to Russ. She preferred to just erase it. But she could sense his curiosity hanging in the air, like the last remaining unpopped balloon. In a way, I'm not supposed to be here right now, she told Russ. I'm halfway done with the master's electrical engineering program over in Laramie. When my dad got sick, I took a gap year to come back home to help out for a while. He's got stage four biliary cholangitis, for what it's worth. He's not getting any better, and it's starting to look like it might be more than a year's leave, she said. I'm sorry, Russ told her. It really sucks to be back, Nina said. I loved college. I love engineering. But my parents are running out of money, so here I am. To help with the bills, I took a shitty job over at the sporting goods shop on Main. Morty's Sporties, Russ said. That's the one. I thought it would just be selling night crawlers to my friend's dads. And at first it was like that. But from the start, the owner, Morty, made me uncomfortable. There was a lot of, where's my hug, whenever my shift started and ended, that kind of thing. I didn't like it, but I told myself he was just lonely or whatever. A few weeks ago, he came behind the register to use the fax machine, and I felt his fingers brush against my ass. It's a tight space, so I hoped it was just an accident. But it happened again last weekend. Now the accidents are coming more frequently and more boldly. Two days ago, he reached for a stapler and slid the back of his hand all the way across my left breast. And you can't quit? Or sue the fuck out of him? We need the money now, not after some protracted legal battle. I'm afraid to even let him see how gross it's making me feel inside. Fuck, Russ said. Yeah. You've got a sick dad, a family that's going broke, and a pervy, gropey boss. Yep. Just eight months ago, I was happy and free learning about all the wonders of electrical science. It's been a precipitous fall. Want to help me with my problem? Russ said. I found a weird rock. He conjured the yellow and green stone out of his pocket and waved it in the air like a magician. Nina laughed. I'd love the distraction of this little mystery. Come on, I'll show you the lab. They walked together toward the north side of the property. The previous owner had constructed a barn 500 yards from the back of the house, and next to it, two large 600-square-foot aluminum storage structures. During the summer, the storage units became unbearably warm. In the winter, they were Nina's ad hoc science lab. Nina held the door open for Russ, leaning over to flip on the lights. She had daisy-chained a series of hanging bulbs to a switch on the wall. The cords ran, unsecured, around the perimeter of the structure, and the bulbs would swing dramatically if she slammed the door too hard. Still, when she threw the switch, the entire lab was illuminated. Russ entered warily. He seemed to be afraid to touch the various machines she'd compiled throughout the room. She saw him notice her other Burris XTR scope. A friend had cracked it on a hunting trip they'd taken together years ago. Nina had fished it out of the trash. Russ moved around the space where the scope was mounted. He stared at it curiously. Is there a reason you zip-tied a broken scope to the end of a broken ski pole? Russ crouched on the ground, looking closer at the construct. Held steady by more zip-ties that were, he ran his hand along the bottom, woven into the leather of a broken beanbag chair? Russ poked the beanbag carefully with a finger. Did you take out the beads and fill this full of sand? Nina shrugged. You can't run an electronics lab without optics, can you? I don't know, Russ admitted. He took a step back and accidentally bumped into her toolbox. A multimeter tipped over the edge, but Russ was fast enough to catch it. Nina cleared a space on one of the tables packing a loose soldering iron back into its case. She laid down a plastic mat. The rock, she said, gesturing to Russ. 
Russ placed the green rock into her palm. She turned it over carefully. She saw that Russ was still holding the multimeter. On a whim, she said, let me see that a second. Nina touched each of the multimeter's pins to the surface of the rock. She flipped the dial to check the AC current, and the needle swung quickly, wedging itself against the maximum readout. She switched the dial to the DC current, and the needle did the same thing. It's not magnetic, but it's generating power from each current. That shouldn't be possible. Where did you get this again? I found it in my grandma's bookstore. Maybe my grandpop got his hands on it sometime before he died. I think it might be a power source. Like a battery? Yeah, almost exactly, except batteries are generally direct current. By their nature, they can't be both AC and DC, at least not without a converter. This rock is generating power in both currents beyond what my multimeter can track. Nina rubbed her chin thoughtfully. It's so odd. She held the rock up to look at it closer, then she carried it over to the Burris scope. She placed the rock on a raised platform in front of the scope, and then stared through the eyepiece, carefully observing the groove patterns in the yellow veins. Still staring through the scope, she pointed to a corner of the shed. There is an LCR meter on a cart right over there. Could you bring it to me? A moment later, Nina heard the squeaking of the cart's rusty wheels, and Russ placed the copper probe into her hand. She held the end against the rock, and the reading shot up to its maximum of 100 kilohertz. She tried an oscilloscope next, but had already predicted what would happen. The XY axes on the meter pinned against their highest point, regardless of which part of the rock she focused on. You probably shouldn't be carrying this around in your pocket, Nina told Russ. But what is it, he asked her. It's not like anything I've ever seen before and it's radiating immense power. It doesn't look natural. Come look through the scope. Russ took Nina's position in front of the scope. She stood behind him, not noticing how good he smelled. Look on the left edge, she told him. See the prominent vein, the darkest one in the top third? Yeah. Notice the pattern? It goes left, right, curl, left, curl, Something like that? I see it. Now look at that same general area on the right side. Curl, left, curl, right, left. It's the same pattern, mirrored. The rock itself is not symmetrical, but the pattern is. Russ glanced up from the scope to smile at Nina. That's incredible. How the heck did you notice that? She felt a rush of pride, despite herself. The answers are always in the details. And that kind of symmetry can't be common in nature, Russ started to say. Bilateral symmetry is fairly common in nature, Nina interrupted gently. She drew a line in the air, from Russ's nose down to his waist, including the two halves of your own body. Russ grinned. Then he admitted, I'm pretty far from being a scientist. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have corrected you. I am a scientist, but I'm also being a snob. You're being a huge help. Here's the interesting thing, though. Bilateral symmetry is never found in geological patterns, at least not that I'm aware of. These vein patterns, I think they were inscribed onto the rock. It's man-made, Russ said, realizing what she meant. You must leave it with me. I have to study it more. Five, Russ. Russ left Nina's lab feeling lighter than he had in weeks. She really was the smartest person in Evanstown. He reached the fence at the perimeter of her property and snapped the last balloon free from its string, stopping to watch it rise shakily into the breezy Wyoming sky. He was probably a little heavy on the gas pedal as he zipped down Route 107, then on to old Highway 89. He had cranked his grandma's AM-FM radio so loud that he almost missed Nina's text when it blinked across the face of his phone. It read, I'll keep the rock safe and bring it back tomorrow. You forgot your shoes, but... 
Russ was still reading the last line, not at all dreaming of Nina's perfect smile, when he looked back out the windshield and caught the spotted, chestnut-colored tail of the deer crossing right in front of his headlights. Russ woke up hours later in a pile of bloody leaves, hoping his strange night in the forest had been a dream. When he looked to his left, the head of the deer carcass was staring back at him. Some joker had taken the time to rest it against the tree, its dead eyes staring deeply into Russ's soul. Russ leaped back, scrambling to his feet too quickly. The rush of blood made his head spin. Remarkably, his body didn't ache. Was it a dream? It had to be a dream, he told himself. A panicked look around the clearing revealed no sign of the dead alien cat or any of the strange hunters who had clambered through the dark. It was a dream, Russ told himself, but then his eyes settled once more on the shredded deer carcass. He took a step toward it, and something odd jangled from his left ankle. The thing attached there shined back at him in the soft morning light. He bent down and examined it, a woven metal anklet clasped tightly just above his ankle bone. It was made of thin rivets, linked in a masterful weave. To the normal observer, it might have looked like a tasteful piece of jewelry. To Russ, it looked like a handcuff. There didn't seem to be any way to unclasp it or get it off. His eyes barely registered the large purple bruise on the back of his calf until the memory flashed through his head of how he'd gotten it. An explosion of fur and claws his hurtling backwards through the air, smashing into the sapling tree. It was enough. He wanted out of this magical forest, now. He barely took the time to search for his grandfather's white feather. The brush was thick and scattered with deer remains. He hated to leave the gun behind, but his desire to get away was stronger than his desire for the family heirloom. He found the car where he'd left it, parked carefully on the side of Highway 89, its front bumper crushed, bloody. The note his grandma left him on the kitchen table said the following. I'm not worried. I know you're a young man capable of staying out all night without telling his dear grandmother where he's gone. Perhaps you've spent the entire night with Nina. I did not think she was the type but I hardly understand young people these days. I'm out with Bibi, not worrying. P.S. Bobby at Ace liked your roofing idea. He said for me to pass along his phone number. We should talk before you make him any kind of deal. Russ read the note crouching next to the couch, his free hand rolling the anklet up and down the lower part of his leg. He glanced at the device again. It was clearly some kind of woven metal, a quarter of an inch wide and as smooth as sea glass. And there was an energy coming from it. When he pressed his forefinger against the metal, he felt a faint pulsing, almost as if the device itself was breathing. The more he studied it, the more he felt that it wasn't built in America, or on Earth, or during the 21st century. A part of him knew that the whole experience in the forest was linked to the discovery of the weird rock. An Obin's stone is like intergalactic catnip, the man called Kendron had told him. The rock had drawn the alien cat to the planet. The cat had brought the hunters. He put the note down and went out the kitchen door into the large double garage. The garage was nearly the size of the house, and it had 29 rare guns hanging on every available bit of wall space. Russ saw the Car 98 and the Merkel 141. As he hurried past, his eyes lingered a moment on the empty space where the white feather usually hung. Russ found a chisel on his grandpa's workbench and tested the point against the ringlets on the anklet. Next, he found the hammer, but he was nervous enough that it slipped from his hand and bounced twice on the floor with two loud clangs. Russ? He heard a familiar voice outside. Nina? Yeah. What are you doing in there? Nothing. I've got your rock and your shoes. You didn't text me back, which I admit kind of hurt my feelings, but I thought I'd better bring them by early. I've been out here knocking. Yes, uh... Hold on a second. I've got some problems in here. What's going on? Just, just what? 
Just wait while I try to remove a potential alien tracking device from my leg. Just hang out while I come to terms with the idea that I may have run across legit men in black and helped them kill a huge alien. And that the alien might have been drawn to Earth by the very same rock you're probably holding in your hand. Russ pushed the garage door opener and watched anxiously as the door slowly rose. Nina was wearing black hiking boots, black leggings, and a yellow workout top. I need you to come hit me with this hammer, he told her. You're an interesting guy, Russ, Nina said, stepping into the garage. He was holding the chisel to the thing on his ankle. Your face is all banged up, she said, and your chest. Look at that bruise on your leg. Take the hammer, Russ insisted. Nina ignored the hammer, choosing to kneel on the floor and touch the anklet with her finger. What is this thing? It doesn't look normal. Russ lowered the garage door again, then turned her palm upward and put the hammer firmly in it. Hit the chisel as hard as you can. Really? Right now. It's very important you hit it right now. He cringed, looking at the far wall of the garage as Nina hauled back, hammer cocked over her head. Most jewelry has some kind of clasp, she said, hammer poised. Hit it, Russ commanded. She brought it down lightly on the top of the chisel. The anklet quivered, sending a volt of electricity through his body. The electricity traveled up the head of the hammer, shocking Nina as well. She let out a short scream and fell onto her backside. Again, the hammer clanged to the floor. Russ shook his head, grimacing away the pain. You okay? he asked. Are you okay? she asked back. Then she crouched on her knees and stared at the device more carefully. Where did that power come from? Something this small shouldn't be able to generate that many volts. She touched it carefully. I don't see a battery pack or even a port for charging it. This has something to do with the rock, doesn't it? The rock is called an Obin's stone, Russ told her, and we probably shouldn't hold on to it for too long. How do you know its name? What is it? Get the anklet off and I'll tell you everything I know. Nina was still rubbing her fingertips where the electricity had punched through her body. Can I have it? Nina asked, gesturing to the anklet. Her face was flush with excitement. You get her off, you can have it, Russ promised her. He put the hammer back in her hand. Just give me a second, he said. He took a few stabilizing breaths. As he waited for the pain to dull, he glanced around at his grandfather's huge gun collection, but the familiar sight made everything that was happening seem that much weirder. Hit it again, Russ told Nina. You sure? she asked. She found a loop of rubber insulation next to the workbench and wrapped it around her hand. Then she raised the hammer again. Nina's face was full of concern, but it didn't keep her from hitting the chisel, harder this time. The electricity shot through Russ's body with so much force, he thought he might pass out. Nina dropped the hammer in order to catch his arm and hold him steady. What on earth is going on? she asked. Not earth, maybe, Russ gasped. Hit it one more time. I won't, Nina insisted. Just once more. No, your central nervous system is not made to take repeated blasts of electricity. You could knock your heartbeat off cycle and die. Just once more, Russ said, reaching for the hammer with shaking hands. Nina danced away from him. When he stepped toward her, the anklet fired another shock of electricity into his body. It dropped him to his knees. He tried to roll back onto his butt, but the anklet spasmed a fourth time and it laid him flat. He could feel sweat pouring down his forehead and was even faintly worried that he must look like a huge dead spider curled up on its back. Russ, I'm going to call a doctor. You've probably harmed your heart and your chest is a mess. Put your phone away, Russ panted. The anklet spasmed a fifth time with much less juice than the previous four. The jolt was followed by a loud clicking sound. Then Russ felt the device fall away from his ankle. Through ringing ears, he heard the two halves clanking to the floor. A second later, a mass of black goo spurted out of both halves and sprayed across Russ's leg. He kicked the device away, then rubbed at the goo, trying to get it off. None of it transferred to his hand. 
It had already hardened into a thick black shell. Is that ink? Nina asked. It shot out like a squid. She wiped at the goo with the tip of the rubber insulation. I tried to steal a dress from a clothing store when I was 15. When I broke off the alarm dongle, ink came out just like that. It's not ink, Russ said. With the anklet broken in half, he found himself finally starting to calm down. But I think you're right. It's some kind of anti-tampering protocol. Russ rubbed his eyes, wondering what the hardened ink could mean. He paced quickly in a circle. Russ, what's happening? Do you have the rock? Give it to me. Nina handed him the Oban's stone. She had wrapped it in aluminum foil and was carrying it in a canvas sack. You shouldn't touch it with your hands unless you absolutely have to. I ran tests all night. She yawned. Despite the excitement of the situation, she couldn't seem to stop herself. I learned a few things, but the results were all over the place. Whatever it is, it's powerful. An Oban's stone, Russ said again. What does that word mean? When Russ didn't answer, she said, Can I take you to the hospital, Russ? The nearest one is in Banville, but I'm sure their ER is open. Russ sat on the ground again, rubbing at the hardened black goo on his ankle. No, this isn't a situation for a hospital. He dug at the goo with the chisel, but he could tell that his skin would pull free before the substance ever did. Nina went over to the two halves of the anklet. She picked them up carefully, holding the anklet away from her body. One end fired a spurt of goo, which landed harmlessly on the ground and hardened immediately. Nina wrapped both halves of the anklet in the rubber insulation. Tell me what's going on right now. Russ told her almost everything. He left out the part about the size of the alien creature, because even saying it in his head made him feel like a madman. They had moved into the backyard and were sitting on either side of a picnic table, which Russ's grandma had decorated with a series of small potted succulents. Nina had the anklet unwrapped, and she was examining it carefully. You helped a bunch of hunters kill a deranged mountain lion, and now you're afraid they want to kidnap you, she said. They used the word conscript, Russ explained quietly. And the Obin's stone? It attracted the cat. That's what one of the hunters told me. It must have smelled the stone on my clothes. In fact, I know it did, based on the way it stalked me. Usually, mountain lions don't like rocks. This was a special mountain. Russ stopped mid-sentence. He wasn't sure how much to say, not because he didn't trust Nina, but because he didn't want her to think he was a lunatic. He was saved from having to answer by a sharp knocking on the front door. Russ held his finger up to his lips, motioning for Nina to be quiet. They crept to the end of the cedar fence, and Russ peeked through the gap between two of the slats. He could see portions of the front walkway. They were scrunched so close together that Nina was almost in Russ's lap. But she didn't seem to mind. The person at the door was partially obscured by the shrubs around the front window, but Russ could tell it wasn't a member of the gang from the night before. It was a man in his late fifties. His hair was gray at the temples, and he was wearing a badly fitting business suit. If I'm hiding in the backyard from a salesman or an evangelical, I'm going to feel pretty silly, Russ thought. They waited silently for the old man to give up and leave. The man knocked again, and Russ could hear him jiggling the knob. Is that one of them? Nina whispered. I don't think so. There were four total, a guy and two girls around our age, and a woman closer to mid-thirties. And this all happened on the way home from my house last night? Yeah. I'm so curious, Nina whispered. I would use the word alarmed, Russ whispered back. Russ watched as Nina took one last look at the two pieces of the electrified anklet, then rewrapped them in the rubber insulation. She disengaged from their little huddle and slinked back toward the house. Where are you going? They're looking for you, not me. I can be your spy. She was already across half the yard, too far away to hear a whisper. Russ bugged his eyes and shook his head, slicing his fingers back and forth across his throat. A few moments later, he heard the bolt slide back and the front door creak open. He couldn't hear everything they were saying 
The words drifted in and out depending on the tone and volume. Think you have the wrong house. Your name, young person? Dorina. Don't ask how it's... A female? They lowered their voices too much for Russ to understand, then trailed off into silence. He watched Nina's body language shift, then heard her voice rise in anger. Then the door clicked shut again, and he watched Nina through the back windows, coming around to the kitchen. He rubbed his hand unconsciously over his sore ribs. The pain seemed to be returning, slowly trickling back. Russ turned to see the man leave the porch slowly, rotating his head back and forth, ticking in everything. Russ hoped it was just his imagination, but the man's face looked abnormal. All the pieces were in place, but even from that distance, his eyes seemed unnaturally large, and his skin was off color, closer to candle wax than actual flesh. The gaze from those huge eyes lingered for a while on the fence line, and Russ was sure he'd been spotted, but the man kept scanning, finally reluctantly climbing into a gray Ford and turning the ignition. Russ moved into the kitchen, quietly pulling the door shut. Nina was sitting in one of the dinner table chairs, looking confused. I don't think this is going to make you feel any better, she said. He asked if I was Russell Wesley. Six, Russ. Nina fired up the engine and put the truck in drive. Russ had the idea that if the anklet device had been tracking him, like some kind of alien GPS, then the best thing to do was get away from wherever it had sent its last signal. He insisted that Nina throw the remains out the window, but she wouldn't budge. You promised I could keep it, she reminded him. The man asked if you were me, Russ said for the second time. Was he blind? Not with those huge eyes. He kept staring, like he was analyzing me. When I said no, of course I wasn't Russell. He asked if I was female gendered. That's when I got kind of mad because I knew right away. The first time I saw you, it scared me. You got mad or you got scared? I got mad because I got scared. His weird face was enough to put me on edge. But the questions... The whole time he was carefully studying my eyes, trying to make sure I was telling the truth. And his skin, it was too yellow. I mean, the whole thing was off. I wish I hadn't answered the door. Let's go to the bookstore, Russ said. And there was one other freaky detail, Nina added, cranking the wheel to turn onto the on-ramp for Highway 61. My cell phone started making all this noise, like interference. The closer he got, the louder the static. Nina made a noise in the back of her throat, mimicking radio static. That only happens when a nonlinear circuit element comes in contact with a wave pulse, and a cell phone is the one supposed to be sending the waves, not detecting them. It's so curious. I'm certain those words mean something to someone, Russ replied. Nina lapsed into silence. Russ could see her pupils dodging back and forth as she tried to make sense of what was happening. He was a robot, Nina said suddenly, as she pulled the truck to a stop in front of the bookstore. The sign in the window was still blinking, open. A robot? That's why my phone was emitting static. He was what was sending the wave pulse. It's probably how he communicates with his creator or his boss or whatever. I couldn't get the sight of his skin out of my head, and it just clicked. It was thin, yellow, plasticky because he was made of motherfucking plastic. When we broke the anklet, we summoned a Terminator. Whew, Russ said. What is it? I was worried that you would think I was loony, but you're way crazier than I am. Nina punched Russ in the arm. His skin was plasticky, I swear. He was a simulation of a human, probably passable from a distance, but not up close. What have you gotten me into? Also, and don't let this detract from how scared I am, I've got to get my hands on that tech. Nina chewed at her bottom lip. Russ hardly noticed. He was deep in thought. The rock brought the cat. The cat brought the team of hunters. The hunters brought the anklet. The anklet brought the weird dude. But why? Who sent the guy in the business suit? And why couldn't he tell Nina was female-gendered? 
Was it possible he really was a robot? Even in her agitated state, Nina couldn't miss the condition of the bookstore. Oh, no. What happened to the mysterious universe, she asked. Roof leak, neglect, terminal illness. I'm going to get it up and running again. That's good. Quite a job, though. Nina patted her pockets with her open palms. There's very stale tea in the break room, Russ promised. Simulacra, Nina said absently. Huh? The robot. It's called simulacra when something inorganic mimics something organic. Russ led her into the break room. He wiped down a dusty coffee mug with the end of his shirt, then checked the mug for stains. Finding none, he filled it with the stale tea. It's cold, and we're going to have to share, he told Nina. She wasn't listening. She had pulled out the two parts of the anklet and put them side by side on the circular break room table. She analyzed each part, running her fingers over them, even touching her tongue lightly to one of the broken edges. It's still holding a charge, she said. This is not any kind of tech I've ever seen. I'm itching to get it back to my lab. I haven't told you everything, Russ said. There's one more important detail. Nina glanced up from the device, ready to hear more, but Russ had trouble finding the words. That mountain lion I was telling you about? It wasn't normal-sized. I mean, it must have weighed at least 800. And once again, before he could explain the alien nature of his encounter, there was a knock on the front door. Shit, Russ said. What do we do? We sit here very quietly, Russ commanded. The two of them sat in the stillness of the break room, unwilling to make a sound. They stared at each other, though Nina's gaze darted back and forth between his own and the wall that separated them from the door. The silence hung heavy. Russ was sure enough time had passed that he could have counted to 100 slowly. Then the knock came again. I have to see what's out there, Russ whispered. I'm so curious, Nina admitted. They peered around the corner of the hallway as stealthily as they could. A large shape loomed on the stoop, blocking out the sunlight. It was big, nearly too big to be human. It was also round, carrying a disproportionate amount of its weight in its front midsection, like it had eaten voraciously for a long, long time. It was sweaty. Oh, no, Nina said, truly terrified. That's my boss, Morty. What in the hell is he doing here? Russ asked. A second later, Morty knocked again. It took Russ only a few seconds to cross the small store and wrench open the door. We're closed, he told Morty. Morty looked back at him, a smug look on his broad face. He was a big guy, close to Russ's height, but at least 150 pounds heavier, almost all of it in an impressive, gravity-defying beer gut. He was carrying a rolled-up paper bag that said Daisy's Donuts across its face. It was spotted with grease. Morty's shirt was equally spotted, but by sweat. Even though it was an unusually temperate day, Russ could see the sweat pooled in small rings around Morty's armpits and all along where his ribcage would be if you could peel away all the body mass. Why does your sign say open? Morty asked. It's optimistic, Russ told him. Where's Norma? She's home. Her husband just died. Yeah, yeah, Morty agreed. How about taking off, Russ suggested. Morty peered over Russ's shoulder. I just need a book really quick. It looks like you could use the business. We're closed, Russ said again, but Morty wouldn't budge off the stoop. The two men stared at each other, neither one moving. More sweat was forming on Morty's forehead, the unfortunate side effect of moving around so much weight. It dripped into his eyes, but that didn't stop him from bird-dogging Russ. If you turned off your sign, you wouldn't waste people's time like you've wasted mine, he said finally. Maybe I should waste your time for a while. Morty nudged his foot forward, blocking the door from closing. Russ didn't want to give an inch to this enormous asshole, but he found his mind winding back to the threat of the simulacra. Will you leave if I grab you what you need? I'm looking for books on poetry, 
Morty told him. Who? Russ asked. Whitman? Dickinson? Not that crap, Morty said. His voice dropped to a whisper, as if they were conspiring together about something. Give me the best poet of all time. Somebody everyone loves, he said. I need a better understanding of how to write stanzas and all that hoopla. Russ left Morty on the stoop and retreated to the poetry section. That's one mystery solved, Russ said to himself while he pulled a used, musty copy of the Cambridge Shakespeare from a shelf. Nina was peeking out from the hallway, and Russ flashed her a quick look at the book cover. She grimaced. Russ handed Morty the book, his free hand on the door, already pulling it closed. Morty stared at the book suspiciously. How much? It's C-1199, Russ told him. I've got to get my wallet out of the car. Morty finally shuffled his large body off the stoop. Why are you shopping without your wallet? I wasn't sure you were open, Morty called out as he turned the corner to the small parking lot at the side of the bookstore. Son of a bitch, Russ mumbled. Just keep the book, he called. He waited for Morty to respond. Instead, he heard Morty say to someone, Sorry, friend, they're closed. I'm just returning something to the proprietor, a familiar voice responded. A Tara came around the corner from the parking lot wearing a camouflaged hunting backpack and cradling Russ's grandfather's white feather in her hands. Even though Russ hadn't been able to see her very well in the dark forest the night before, it was unmistakably her. Russ tried to pull the door shut, but he hadn't moved from the doorway, so he just ended up banging it against his own toes. Though he was ashamed to admit it, his main thought was, how did I not notice that she was this pretty? Atara had close-cropped wavy brown hair and bright blue eyes. She was on the short side, maybe five foot three, but her body was lean and well-muscled. She had a hint of mischief in her eyes that attracted Russ immediately. She was the one they'd called El Toreador, and it was quickly apparent why. Once she reached the stoop, she moved faster than Russ's eyes could follow. One moment she was in front of him, then she was ducking under his arm, then she was inside the store, standing between him and the hallway, presenting the white feather in outstretched hands. Hey, man, Atara said. Hey. What's up, Russ said, taking the rifle and a few steps back. He popped open the receiver and found it unloaded. He leaned the rifle against the wall, his hands raised slightly to show Atara he didn't mean any harm. You're Pretty fast, Russ said. Like a Toreador, Atara nodded, rolling her forearm in a Toreador's bow. When they gave me that nickname, most of the crew probably didn't understand it wasn't entirely appropriate for a Jewish girl from New England, but I've been sticking with it. You've had a strange day, I'm guessing. Yeah, Russ confirmed. A strange 24 hours. Both of them paused as a Ford turned from the street into the parking lot, haphazardly bumping its front right wheel on the curb. Russ recognized the car as the one that had brought the simulacra that morning. He glanced over his shoulder to see if Atara knew what was happening. She stood behind him, silently listening. They heard the Ford's door open and shut. Say, partner, do you have 1199 I could borrow? Morty's voice cut in from around the corner. Are you Russell Wesley? The simulacra asked in response. No, sir. I'm Morty Forty of Morty's Sporties over on Maine. Are you male gendered? Atara turned her head toward the voice. Your day is about to get a little stranger. As she spoke, she grabbed Russ's shirt collar and dragged him backward into the store. The yellowy old man in the oversized business suit turned the corner and took two long paces toward the front stoop. Russ fumbled the lock closed and then reached up and pulled the string to turn off the open sign. Is there a back door? Atara hissed. He led her quickly down the hall. When they reached the break room, Nina stuck her head out. The two women eyed each other suspiciously. Who are you? Nina asked. Who are you? Atara responded. The simulacra is outside, Russ told Nina. I did not expect to see one of those here, Atara said. You must have broken the anklet. Did you get the ink anywhere on yourself? Russ lifted the leg of his jeans and showed her the ink. No sense running, then, Atara said. That's nanotech. 
Basically, millions and millions of tiny tracking bots. A few have probably burrowed under your skin already. Russ was alarmed by that idea. What do we do? We've got to destroy the... What did you call it? Simulacra, Nina said. We've got to destroy the simulacra. Otherwise, it won't stop coming. They're not fast, but they're relentless. Check this out. Still facing Russ and Nina, Atara kicked the back door open with the heel of her boot. Standing stock still in the alley behind Norma's store was the old man in the business suit. He stood without expression, staring blankly forward, his arms hanging at attention on either side of his body. Within seconds of seeing Russ, he came back to life, his eyes narrowing with purpose, his hands reaching. Atara hooked the door with her foot and pulled it closed again. A moment later, the sound of fists pounding on the door filled the small hallway. How did he get back there so fast? Russ asked. I've only got $9.25, Morty called from out front. I figure that ought to be enough. Just keep the book, Russ shouted again. What you called simulacra, we call an SAS unit. I think this is one of the earlier models, but it doesn't matter. They're low-cost tech, overused and underfunctional. This one will pathfind through any obstacle, relentlessly following the nanotech. It's hunting you. I told you it was a robot, Nina said, excited. Atara shook her head. You shouldn't have broken off the anklet. That's not the best thing to do. You guys put it on me, Russ reminded her. Morty pounded on the front door. The SAS unit kept pounding on the back. Atara turned to Russ. The anklet was a temporary visa. It made you legal, albeit with a limited collection of civic rights. When you broke it, you told the government scanning algorithms that you were trying to stay in UAIB space illegally. But I'm not in UAIB space. I don't think. What the hell is UAIB space? All the creature outside knows is that you were behaving like an illegal alien. Everything's systematized, so it doesn't really matter what the truth is. Atara scrunched up her face apologetically. You're currently on the wrong side of the intergalactic border patrol. I didn't ask for this, Russ reminded Atara. I've got problems of my own. Russ pointed to the roof of the bookstore. What does the simulacra want? Nina asked Atara. Earth is considered an undesirable planet. The file on Earthlings says we're violent toward the environment and each other, and that we use a lot of magical thinking. I wish I could disagree. For a planet like this, the Alliance would prefer the inhabitants never learn the greater secrets of the universe. As such, until you're an officially certified citizen, the SAS units will do their best to make you forget any and all extraterrestrial experiences. What's that mean? Make me forget its central mission is to perform a street-side mind-wiping procedure. The mind-wipe is brutal but effective tech. It attempts to erase so-called undesirable memories by artificially aging your brain. Before you ask, yes, it's extremely painful. And sometimes it goes horribly wrong. Russ could feel himself grinning, but it was the grin of a ghoul. He still managed to chuckle with his face pinched tight. That thing outside wants to attack my brain? Russ asked. It wants to wipe away your memory of me. That big cat, the UAIB, and the Intergalactic Exterminators, Inc. Basically everything from last night, Atara told him. The knocking stopped, and Russ's cell phone started to crackle, making the same static sound that Nina's had. You hear that? Atara asked, her voice full of excitement. The SAS unit is powering up to tear down the door. The noise from Russ's cell phone was growing in pitch and volume. Maybe you can tell us how we stop the robot. Oh, that's easy, Atara said, drawing a gun from her backpack. We kill it. She fished a small suppressor from her pocket and screwed it onto the barrel of the strange-looking pistol. Then she put her hand on the doorknob. Better if we can back it into the alley. The suppressor makes the gun quieter, but not totally silent. If that fat dude on the front stoop hears anything, he might think we're murdering a real human. What should I do? Nina asked. The white feather is by the front door. It's unloaded, but there might be some 7.63 behind the counter. 
Don't let Morty see you, Russ said. Nina slipped out of the hallway and began to crawl toward the register, staying out of view of the front windows. You ready? Atara asked Russ. Russ nodded. I'll knock it off its feet, drive it backwards as far as I can, he whispered. Once I give the signal that I'm clear, you disable it. Okay, Atara said. She threw the door open. The SAS unit was on the other side, its fists glowing electric blue. Until that moment, Russ had had some trepidation about killing something that he wasn't sure wasn't human. But the glowing blue hands were enough to convince him. He launched his body toward it, digging his heels in, confident in the physics of 220 pounds moving quickly forward. As he lowered his shoulder, he was surprised to find the muscle memory from four years of high school football helping him along. He hit the SAS unit with all his force, square in the chest. The simulacra did not budge. It stood its ground spectacularly, and Russ heard the crunching sound of flesh against metal. At the same time, he felt a burst of tremendous pain from his injuries. He suddenly had a different memory from high school, when in a moment of academic frustration, he'd thrown the skeleton from science class against a brick wall. Only in this situation, Russ was the skeleton. He could feel the robot hook its powerful old man arms under his armpits. Then he felt his feet lift off the ground as it leaned back in a perfect suplex. Russ's shoes peeled off on the top of the doorframe, but the rest of him flew through the alley. He landed on a pile of leaves 15 feet away with another burst of agonizing pain. I'm clear, he groaned. The whisper hiss of three bullets leaving Atara's pistol slipped through the air, and Russ heard the SAS unit collapse to the ground. Atara sauntered over, kneeled by his side, and grinned at him. Good teamwork, she said. Then, you've done some impressive damage to your own body, even since yesterday. Didn't Baren tell you to be careful? That you couldn't feel the damage, but it was still there? Is it dead? And... Do you have any more of that medicine? Russ gasped. It was never alive. And yep, Atara said. She handed Russ a roll of white pills. You can dissolve these in liquid or eat them whole. Still on his back, Russ popped two into his mouth. That's the last you're getting until you sign on with the crew, Atara said. Russ could feel a warm tingling sensation as the medicine swept through his body. It started in his chest, at his heart, and moved outward, evaporating the pain in a blissful wave. I never said I was signing with any crew, Russ told her, rolling back to his knees. He stared at the SAS unit, which was lying on its stomach, one leg splayed awkwardly to the side. See, that's where your situation gets a little complicated, Atara told him, slipping the pistol into her pocket. She went back to the door and plucked Russ's shoes off the ground, looking at their condition with exaggerated horror. Also, it looks like you could really use a paycheck. Atara hooked her free hand around the SAS unit's collar and dragged it deeper into the alley. She hefted it with some difficulty and dropped it into the bookstore's dumpster. The Alliance isn't a bunch of fascist swine. We've got laws and civil rights. We don't perform abductions anymore. There's no probing unless you specifically request it. In fact, we don't employ anyone without their official signed permission. It's why we tagged your leg instead of just throwing you aboard our ship. We thought a day or two to process what had happened might make you more open to the idea. Russ climbed to his feet, flexing his arms and shoulders as he joined Atara at the dumpster. That medicine is fantastic, he said. Atara withdrew a small piece of paper and began to unfold it. It unpacked into a long, legal-sized document. She read from it. The undersigned agrees to the employ of the Intergalactic Exterminators Incorporated for a time period beginning upon the act of signing and ending with either termination or death. Early termination, for any reason, shall result in the signee owing the IEI all the costs of certification training and surrendering itself to a mandatory mind cleanse. Before she finished reading, Russ took the document away from her and folded it back up. It wasn't paper, exactly. It felt like half-liquid goo. From the back door, he heard Nina gasp. She had the white feather in her hands. Sign the paper, she insisted. 
Russ held up the folded document. This contract is for life. I don't know what the job is, what the pay is, who my employer is. I'm going to read it before I sign it. Nina's eyes narrowed. He's not going to sign it. You're not going to sign it, are you? I don't think he's going to sign it, Atara said. She glanced over at Nina. Anyway, it's his decision to make, not yours. Atara finally handed Russ his ratty, open-tongued shoes. I'm not going to lie. The job's dangerous as hell, but it pays the equivalent of two grand a week, which it looks like you could really use. I probably will sign it, Russ said. I'll sign it right now, Nina said. I need a job worse than anyone has ever needed one. What's the job? And who is this alliance you keep mentioning? Atara took a moment to grab scraps of trash, mostly moldy books, and layer them on top of the SAS's body. Something about Nina seemed to bother her, but she answered the question. About three quarters of the cosmos, including the part we're in, is governed by a capitalist collective, the United Alliance of Intelligent Beings, or UAIB. They're a loose conglomerate of 73 sentient species. They work like the U.S. federal government, proposing and voting on galactic rule changes and so forth. For our purposes, their most important function is keeping the municipal services up and running. The Galactic Border Patrol, Atara nodded toward the robot in the dumpster. Law enforcement, infrastructure maintenance, transport security, refuse disposal, ecosystem preservation, and emergency response. The UAIB collects taxes and funds the teams that keep the galaxy safe and orderly. Or a close approximation thereof. The job I'm offering, Russ, is with ecosystem preservation. Pest control, mostly. You're offering him a job with a government agency in space? For two grand a week? Nina gave Russ a look like he was crazy for not signing the contract immediately. Yes and no. Like all government work in a capitalist collective, there are some hoops to jump through. There's always a push to privatize government systems, save on taxes, that sort of thing. The system, in its current fragile state, is one of freelance workers fighting for government subsidies. My team, the IEI, is one of a couple dozen different municipal extermination squads, all of us racing around the galaxy trying to get jobs done and keep fuel in the tank. Freelance pest control, Nina said, based on government commissions. She seemed to have wrapped her head around the idea, no matter how ridiculous it sounded to Russ. Not pests, Russ explained to her. Think much larger than that. The UAIB qualifies a pest as any species that jumps planets and is identified as invasive to its new environment. You know, like a threat to the ecosystem, Atara explained. If that big kitty Russ killed last night had stayed on Earth, it could have thrashed all of southwestern Wyoming. I want the job, Nina said again. And I'm not offering it to you, Atara said firmly. I'm here speaking for my boss. Last night, Russ happened to catch her eye. It's an uncommon opportunity for an earthling. Trust me on that, and it shouldn't be turned down casually. Atara dropped her backpack at Russ's feet. Take a day or two to think about it if you want. If you decide to sign, unpack that backpack and wait. We'll do the rest. Russ, tell her you'll take the job. What about the nanobots on my leg? How do I get those off? Russ asked Atara. Not with Earth tech, Atara said, shrugging. That's what I meant about your situation being complicated. Since the SAS unit failed, the UAIB's automated systems will send more maybe two or three at a time. They'll keep coming until you're granted certification, or they get their fingers into your brain and you forget any of this ever happened. You guys put the anklet on me. You should also be able to call off the SAS. Of course, we can, Atara smiled slyly. But you know governments move slowly. We've got the paperwork to fill out, to notarize. It needs to be filed with the correct bureau. Tomorrow's a galactic holiday, and then there's the weekend. Even if we did file the exception right away, it would be three or four days before your record got expunged. That's if we filed it right away, 
Atara said again, as if the possibility was growing more remote by the second. What do I do about the SAS? Russ demanded. Sign the contract, Atara told him, as if the answer were simple. In the meantime, consider the SAS a free first lesson in extermination. Wow, what an action-packed start to the adventure. Should Russ take this job despite the repulsive contract? He clearly loves to explore, and this job would allow him to do that in ways he never could have imagined. On the other hand, he hates committing to anything, and this is one heck of a commitment. And Nina needs a job more than anyone else in the universe. Will she find a way to steal the job right out from under his nose? Tune in to the next episode to find out. So don't forget to subscribe to CamCat Unwrapped. Tune in to hear all our audiobooks as we release them right here on CamCat Unwrapped as serialized podcasts. The first two episodes of every book can always be found here, but subsequent episodes will be available for free listening only for a short time after their release. After that, they'll be gone. But don't worry. The audiobooks are always available for purchase on Audible and other major retailers. If you don't want to miss a beat, listen now on the audiobook platform of your choice. All our books are also available in print and ebook formats on camcatbooks.com or wherever books are sold. Before you go, please take a moment to leave us a review on your preferred podcast platform. Thank you. Camcat Unwrapped also offers other Camcat books as podcasts. Also, check out our interviews with authors, editors, and other bookworms, and our background episodes, where we unwrap exclusive content relating to our books. Tune in again to CamCat Unwrapped, because CamCat Unwrapped is where book lovers meet. Mm -hmm.